We've tapped into their radios. We can confirm two divisions. Confirmed. You have an aerial visual. Copy. Yes, yes. We can hear them moving in. Only none of what the Germans thought they could see or hear was real. During World War II, a secret division of the US Army, now known as the Ghost Army, conducted over 20 tactical operations, which resulted in saving tens of thousands of lives. The mission? To trick the enemy into thinking that their unit of 1,000 men was actually two divisions of 30,000 men. But the Ghost Army wasn't made up of traditional soldiers. The majority were actors, designers, advertisers and artists who had been recruited from the top art and design schools around the country. And this army of artists used their creativity for an infantry of illusion. Engineers developed inflatable tanks, which the artists would then paint. These tanks could condense down to fit into a portable bag and inflate on demand, much like a bouncy castle. Audio engineers used large speakers to play sound effects of tanks and marching soldiers, which had been pre-recorded at Fort Knox. This marching army could be heard from miles away. Along with fake radio messages sent into the signals of the enemies, they would also send actors dressed as generals and officers into local towns to spread false information and rumours. It wasn't until 1996, when information about the Ghost Army was declassified, that the world finally knew about these masters of misdirection, the unsung heroes of World War II. At the end of World War II, the Soviets were holding Berlin under siege. In order to save millions of people from starvation, the US and Allies devised a plan to airlift in food. One American pilot decided to take it a step further. He delivered candy. My name is Gail Halverson, but I'm known as the Berlin Candy Bomber. I didn't think that the airlift would last very long. So I thought I'd better get a movie of this operation before they send me home. One day, while filming the planes taking off and landing, Gail became aware that there was some young children watching him. He went over to talk to them. And after a while, he realized, Dummy, don't you know kids like chocolate? And I knew that they had not had chocolate in the stores in Berlin for two years. And I reached in my pocket and I, all I had was two sticks of Wrigley's Double Mint Gum. And I broke the two sticks in half, gave it to the kids, and, and the kids with half a stick tore off the wrapper into thin strips and passed it to those without gum. And those who re received the wrappers put it up their nose and smelled a piece of wrapper. Inspired by their generosity, he decided that next flight, he would drop them chocolate and candy via parachute from the plane. They said, how do we know what, what airplane you're in? And so I said, when I come over the airfield, I'll wiggle the wings of that big airplane. And they said, oh, great. True to his word, the next day, Gail began to drop the packages. What started with just two sticks of gum eventually turned into 23 tons of chocolate. From then on, I was known in the press and all the kids in Berlin, that's not the Wiggly Wings. And in case you were wondering if the candy bomber still has a sweet tooth. Oh yeah, I still eat chocolate. I like dark chocolate. Hear that? That is a military code of the Choctaw Nation. Can't understand it? Neither could the Germans. Our story starts on the Western Front during World War I. The Allies are in trouble. The Germans had tapped their phone lines and deciphered their codes. As the Allies struggled to find a solution, one captain overheard two of his Native American Choctaw soldiers speaking their mother tongue. Jim Tukma. When the captain overheard the two soldiers speaking their native language. They probably thought they were in really big trouble. That's Nuchi Nashoba. Hi there. Great granddaughter of one of those two soldiers and president of the Choctaw Code Talkers Association. Around this time, if a Choctaw were caught speaking the language, they were liable to be sent away to a re-education program. But the captain, he had a different idea. If I can't understand what they're saying, perhaps the Germans won't understand what they're saying. The U.S. military began transmitting tactical messages in Choctaw and, unsurprisingly, the Germans could not break the code. Not all military terms had a direct Choctaw translation. Machine gun 
Was little gun shoot fast? Ammunition. Oski. Naki. Was arrows and gas. Mahli. Okpolo. Was bad air. And due at least in part to the Choctaw Code Talkers and their neologisms, the war ended soon thereafter. When you look at how ironic it is for the government to say you can't speak your language, but yet they use them to help win World War I, that's pretty amazing to me. When I realized that monuments of those who served our country and fought for the freedoms that we enjoy today were in disrepair and poor condition, uh, it, it upset me. It's sad to see that they've been forgotten completely. Most of them are unreadable, so no one can tell who they are, what they did, and how they served our country, and what they meant to our country. If you find a gleaming stone that may be 100 or 150 years old, there's a good chance that I've probably been there. My name is Andrew Lumisher, better known as The Good Cemeterian. I restore the monuments of veterans who served in multiple conflicts for our country and their families. I complete restorations on my day off typically, which is Sunday. I have restored between five and 600 monuments to date. Living in the South, there is a multitude of things that accumulate on a given stone. It may have more than 100 years of buildup and mildew and mold. It's very tedious, it's very hard work, soaking a stone with water, scrubbing with brushes. There are toothbrushes and Q-tips. A monument restoration typically will take between two and four months, but there's nothing that makes me feel as good as when I complete a restoration. The reason I began doing this uh, is for both personal and historical reasons. Um, I have friends who served and friends who I lost both in battle and combat, and friends who lost their battle once they came back home. It's important to me to see that they can be remembered and not forgotten. The monuments themselves are not just stones. You know, I, I want to uncover who they were as a human being, as a person, uh, in addition to their sacrifice and their service to our country, uh, because they weren't just soldiers either. They were Americans first, they were soldiers second. I can't allow that to be forgotten. There's something about being part of nature. There's something about being around these animals. To even the most wounded veteran, they feel different. Keeps them part of something greater than themselves. The idea is that you've got to give someone who's been through a severe trauma an opportunity to heal. And we believe in the Warriors and Wolves program and a Back to Nature setting, it does that. We have 40 animals at this facility. There you go, you got it, you'll get that. We've rescued wolves off of chains in Alaska as part of a roadside attraction. We rescued wolf dogs from a backyard breeder in San Diego. I think for all the veterans that we bring out here, whether they work here or they're here for a support group, what rings true is if they can heal, I can heal. The wolves, they know if you're injured or something's wrong with you, and they have the trauma. So, and, you know, we have some type of trauma in life. We can get that connection, and one wolf would be your friend for life. What happens is one animal picks that one veteran. Never again does that animal pick someone else. Never again does that animal want to show the same kind of affection to someone else. What a good boy. Conventional therapy isn't really something for me. It didn't help, to be honest. After 10 years of military life, it, it was sort of a tough transition. Had I continued down my course of being angry, drinking myself to death, it may have been the last chapter of my life. There are things I've seen that I can't unsee. There are things I've done that I cannot undo. Just saying that, well, I did it in the name of my country doesn't help you sleep at night. 
But what does help you sleep is having a companion. They kind of teach you how to be calm and confident. It's, it's got some deeper meaning when they accept you. They accept you into the family, part of the pack. You remember this can. The sweet sauce, the soft noodle, this was childhood. But did you know that Chef Boyardee was an actual chef? He was. His name was Hector, and he made a mean pasta sauce. But it wasn't Hector's sauce that made Chef Boyardee the household name that it is today. You can thank the U.S. military for that. In the 1930s, Hector Boyardee opened up an Italian restaurant in Ohio, and everyone was like, Oh my god, I love your sauce! So he started selling it, and he sold a lot of it. A lot, a lot. By 1938, he had opened up his own factory, selling his sauce and pasta, can. Ask for Chef Boyardee's spaghetti dinner. Only about 15 cents a serving. Then, World War II happened, and a phone call was made. The U.S. military called Hector and said something like, Help make food for the troops! He already had the canning infrastructure, so Hector said, Yeah, all right. His company shifted from a civilian consumer base to a military one. Chef Boyardee became the largest supplier of rations to U.S. and Allied forces. Production was happening 24-7. By the end of the war, the factory was too large, and the military demand no longer existed. Hector didn't know what to do. So he sold it to this large company called American Home Products, who were all like, We got this. They quickly rebranded and distributed the can as easy-to-make at-home meals and filled supermarket shelves across the United States. So today, when we buy Chef Boyardee, we're actually eating rebranded World War II field rations. Yep. <laughs>